I am really excited to welcome back to our stage Jason Retail Geek Goldberg. Um, he's going to spend about 20 minutes outlining some key trends, uh, retail customers uh, in the post-pandemic world that retailers need to know about the most. Uh, Jason is the Chief Commerce Strategy Officer at Publicis Communications and host of the iTunes top-rated e-commerce podcast, The Jason and Scott Show, which I am a regular listener of. Uh, and uh, if you are a Game of Thrones fan, and I, I may be throwing Jason off here, I think of Jason as a three-eyed raven of e-commerce and retail. He is all-knowing. So um, with that uh, high expectations of an introduction, uh, Jason, welcome to our virtual stage, and we're excited to have you back again. Oh, my gosh, Scott. Thank you so much. Thank you for the kind intro. I clarifying question. Am I the three-eyed raven that's dead, or am I uh, Bran, Bran uh, Stark? Uh, yes, you have uh, moved into the Bran Stark. Uh, you know, you have taken over his body, and you will continue to nice. be all-knowing. Spoiler alert, I'm also king of Westeros then. Cool. <laughs> um, I like it. Uh, super excited to be here. Scott told me some of the topics that he thought it would be helpful for me to cover. And so I quickly whipped together a four hour manifesto. It's about 300 slides. And Scott said, this looks great, but can you deliver it in 20 minutes? Um, so, so buckle up. Uh, we're going to try to cover a lot of ground. Um, hopefully it spawns some questions or comments and I'd love to sync up with any of you, uh, at the end or during the coffee chat today or, or via one of the many other, uh, forums you can find me on. Um, in the extraordinarily unlikely event that any of you don't get enough of me, <clears throat> excuse me, in the next uh, 20 minutes, as Scott mentioned, uh, we have this accidentally popular podcast. Uh, Scott was too humble to say, but he's like an eight-time guest on the podcast, and I think those are our eight top-rated shows of all times. Um, but uh, my co-host, Scott Wingo's parents spelled his name wrong, so you can just type Scott with one T uh, wherever you get your podcast and you'll find us. Um, so with that, let's jump into it. Uh, we're really going to talk about what has changed as a result of the pandemic and what smart brands and retailers are going to do post-pandemic and some of the sticky issues that we have to deal with. Um, but I can't do that without just spending a brief moment to kind of recap um, what retail was like in the pandemic. Um, so in the United States of America in 2020, retailers sold $5.6 trillion worth of stuff, um, which is awesome. That's 27% of the total GDP. So we are uh, officially the most important part of the US economy. We're also the largest employer. A normal year, we're about 25% of the GDP. So some of the non-retail sectors actually dipped and retail is even more important than usual. We'll talk about uh, what, what uh, growth looked like in a second. And of course, most of the people on this webinar um, have a, a particular affinity for digital, and we sold $883 billion worth of stuff online, um, which by the most conservative definition of retail, as defined by uh, the U.S. Department of Commerce, that $883 billion represents about 15.7% of all retail spending. So 15% of that, that uh, uh, $5.6 trillion that we talked about before. Um, and so, hey, Jason, was that a tragic year? Was that, you know, uh, what, what happened in retail uh, because of COVID? Well, if we look at that $5.6 trillion in uh, of sales, that represents about a 3.4% growth over 2019. Um, and 3.4% is right in the mean of the sort of typical retail growth we would expect in a normal year. I've kind of graphed the last 10 years. You can see we've had a, the, the highest years in recent history. We grew a, a little over 4%, but we had a lot of years where we grew 1% or 2%. So 3.4% is very healthy growth. If I went back in the time machine to April and told all the retailers that were panicking because of the pandemic that we were going to have 3.4% growth this year, uh, I think every, every retailer would have taken that and been thrilled. Um, and then when we look at the e-commerce growth, um, we, uh, again, most conservative U.S. Department of Commerce estimate, e-commerce grew by 25% in 2020. Um, that's versus we grew by 15% in 2019, and 15% was already an acceleration over the kind of 10-year average. So um, for the, the previous eight years, we had been growing in that kind of 11 or 12% uh, that accelerated last year to, to 10% and then, um, or 15%, and then you know, went straight up to 25% because of the pandemic. 
probably not a surprise to anyone that, that uh, uh, the COVID most goosed digital commerce. Um, but the, the big question about COVID's impact on commerce is which of the behaviors that we observed last year are going to be our new nor normals versus which ones are going to sort of revert back to their, their pre-pandemic behaviors. So I like to paint this metaphor of two doors. And one of the doors is a one-way door. When a customer walks through that door, she's not allowed to walk back through it, right? Um, and so, you know, these are permanent changes in behavior. If you bought a Peloton bike during the pandemic, you're probably not uh, renewing your gym membership um, when, when uh, you get your second vaccine shot. Um, if you had your 50 pound bag of dog food delivered to your house, you're po probably never schlepping that 50 pound bag of dog food across the, um, the parking lot at, at Target again. Conversely, um, if you spent all of your food dollars at grocery stores during the pandemic, um, you, you probably are eager to rush out to a restaurant the first time it feels safe to do so, right? So example of uh, sort of two-way doors that customers will go back through versus one-way doors. So every trend we're gonna talk about, the big open question to ask yourself, and I'll, I'll certainly share my hypothesis, is which of these trends are two-way doors versus one-way doors, right? Um, so the first trend we're gonna talk about, and I would argue the, the biggest overall impact of the pandemic is the acceleration of digital shopping, right? And uh, some of you will remember, uh, McKinsey came out with this great report in April, um, and they called it the leap. And they said like, oh my God, we're getting 10 years of digital acceleration in three months. Before the pandemic, e-commerce was like 15% of retail sales. Um, and uh, by, by the end of Q2 in, in 2020, it's gonna be 35% of all retail sales. Um, so we now have the benefit of seeing what actually happened. Um, and we didn't actually, we had an acceleration for sure. We didn't have this dramatic of an acceleration. The actual acceleration is retail jump from being 13% of all, uh, e-commerce jump from being 13% of all sales to being 15.7% of all sales. So uh, a healthy jump, it peaked in, in April at 19%. Um, this is still two or three years of digital acceleration that we had in, in one year, right? And so the big first question is, ooh, are we gonna go backwards on this? And is 15% gonna regress this year? Are we gonna keep growing at this new rate? Um, are we gonna grow, but more conservatively because we pulled so much digital sales in this year? Um, and uh, my, my own hypothesis, uh, this is a one-way door. All those people that learned how to shop digitally, for the most part, are going to continue to shop digitally. Uh, the growth rate in 2021 is probably gonna be a lot lower than the growth rate in 2020, but it's still gonna be positive growth. Um, but of course, the real answer is a very unhelpful, it depends. Um, and it depends on what category you were in, right? Because there were clear winners and losers in the pandemic. Again, if you were a grocery store and you stole all the dollars that used to go to restaurants, um, you had a huge year, You're, it's probably gonna go backwards a little bit next year. If uh, you were a gas station, you had a catastrophic year, it's probably gonna leap forward in the next year. Um, if we look at who the biggest winner overall was, it, it was digital sales, right? Um, and so that, that's why I say dig, the transformation and acceleration of digital is the biggest trend. But the dirty little secret is the biggest flavor of digital is not what some people would expect. It was not everyone uh, you know, rapidly going to Amazon. Um, they did, and Amazon saw healthy growth, but they didn't get their share, their fair share of all the growth in the market. If we look at the, the top six omni-channel retailers, so retailers that also have parking lots, um, that's Target, Walmart, Best Buy, Kroger, um, their curbside pickup sales went up 130%. So e-commerce went up like 25%, but curbside pickup went up 130%. And for those six omni-channel retailers, curbside pickup represented almost 50% of all their e-commerce sales. Um, so this is a new thing. This is, hey, e-commerce is going way up, but instead of it getting mostly fulfilled from a fulfillment center and uh, fulfilled via FedEx or UPS, 
it's mostly getting fulfilled from a store's inventory um, and it's mostly getting delivered by the customer or a last mile service. In the case of Target, 95% of all their e-commerce orders are being fulfilled by stores. Um, the, so, you know, here's the first question. Is curbside pickup a one-way door or a two-way door? And I, I obviously don't know the answer, um, but being the three AI Raven, I'll tell you my guess is it's a one-way door. And I can tell you who else is guessing that. Walmart, right? So Walmart had these cool robots in all their stores, a giant tower that would deliver uh, BOPUS items, uh, pick up in-store items. Um, and so this was to automate buy online, pick up in-store. Um, and as a result of the pandemic, Walmart is decommissioning all these towers. Why? Because customers have told Walmart that they don't want to go in the store to pick up their online orders anymore. They just want to drive through that curbside pickup experience that they've told Walmart and Kroger is the highest NPS shopping experience they've ever had with Walmart. And they want to pick up those, those purchases curbside is the new normal, right? Um, and so Walmart has designed new stores that they're rolling out and they internally call these stores swipe up. And the reason they call them swipe up is they expect that the new consumer is a digitally enabled omni-channel customer and she's going to use her cell phone while she shops. And so we want to help her swipe up from her phone to our store shelves. And so when you look at the big design changes in this store, number one, there's a way bigger emphasis on curbside pickup, as you can see in the parking lot. Target is doubling the amount of, of space they dedicate to curbside pickup in every parking lot. Most big omnichannel retailers are making permanent investments in curbside pickup, which kind of tells you where their bet is. When you walk into this store, all the signage walking in the store is telling you how to use the Walmart app and how to use the app while you're shopping because this is a digitally enabled Walmart store, right? And there are now about 28 of these, I think, that are open. Um, as you may have heard during the pandemic, Amazon rolled out a new grocery store concept. So this is not Whole Foods. This is an Amazon branded, built from scratch, Amazon grocery store called Amazon Fresh. There are now, uh, I think, almost 30 of these in the US. They just opened the first one in the UK as well. And not surprisingly, this is again, a grocery store that has a lot of digital amenities in the store because all these retailers are banking on um, the customer being a permanent, digitally enabled, omni-channel shopper moving forward in a way that she was not before the pandemic. Before the pandemic, less than 3% of all grocery sales in the US were, were digital. Now, 10% of them were, were uh, digital during 2020. Um, so you go into this new Amazon grocery store and we have smart dash cards with screens that give you suggestive selling and merchandising. We have Amazon Alexa to do wayfinding on the shelf edge and tell you where the milk is. And to me, one of the most important digital amenities is they've replaced the paper sign in all the stores with digital fact tags, right? And so what's, why is that so important, Jason? That doesn't look huge. Because look at the thing in the upper left-hand corner of that fact, fact tag. These uh, Pringles chips have five stars, which they totally earned. Pringles are delicious. Um, and uh, 500 reviews, 497 reviews. Rating and reviews, which are the most influential thing to online selling, are now on the shelf edge of every Amazon store. And oh, by the way, they're getting rolled out in Target and Walmart and Kroger as well. So this digital amenity, ratings and reviews, that was so important online is now going to be the most important thing in store going forward. So think about what that means for, for all the brands trying to sell products through the retail stores. If that weren't enough, Amazon invented a hair salon, right? And why did they invent a hair salon? Well, probably a couple reasons. I don't have time to deep dive in all of them now. But one of the interesting things is they're using this hair salon to test a bunch of new in-store digital shopping amenities. Um, again, they have digital fact tags with QR codes you can use to order the product. They have AR so that you can see your hairstyle before you actually commit to get your hair cut. Um, they have gesture recognition so you can point to products on the shelf and get digital signage with ratings and reviews about those products. Um, we're seeing all kinds of new digitally enabled shopping experiences at brick and mortar because customers are no longer brick and mortar or digital. They're digital first brick and mortar shoppers, right? Um, so lots of implications uh, because of that. Another thing we did during the pandemic is we all consumed a lot of YouTube, right? Uh, and Facebook, since they're the next speaker, sorry. Um, and so by some accounts, like 
Google and YouTube were the biggest winner in the pandemic because of all these extra minutes of video, over air video, took a bath to, to all of these video streaming services. Um, by some, some measures, uh, we doubled the number of minutes we spend consuming digital content. And what that meant is shoppable digital content uh, became much bigger. Things went viral like ocean spray in the, the famous TikTok video. Uh, Walmart saw that and quickly uh, and very agilely for Walmart um, rolled out two, two TikTok shopping events where you could endemically buy products on, on uh, Walmart through a TikTok live stream. And of course, retailers in North America are testing this because this experience is dominant in China, right? Um, the, the biggest e-commerce site in China is Alibaba or, or uh, uh, um, uh, Tmall, but today um, the, the number one source of traffic to Alibaba is Taobao Live, their live streaming site. So customers start their shopping experience on Alibaba by consuming shoppable video. Think, you know, QVC, uh, HSN video on steroids, um, being sold by, by millions of, of key opinion leaders in China. In China, all of this, this social commerce represents almost 12% of their e-commerce sales. In the West right now, it's way smaller. It's three and a half percent. So a lot of brands in the U.S. are like, wait, e-commerce uh, social is super popular in China. And now because of COVID, people spent twice as much time on social networks. We really need to get uh, in on this and understand if Western consumers are going to embrace it. Um, and it's interesting because China, it, you know, despite the fact that they're huge at this, they were not first. You could buy Pampers on Facebook in 2010. The problem is nobody wanted to buy Pampers on Facebook in 2010. Uh, then in the 2019, live streaming became a huge thing in China. It got quickly adopted. And so all of us are speculating, is China systemically different than the West and it's going to be popular there and not here? Or were they just first? Did they leapfrog the Western consumer? And is this going to be a huge year for digital uh, social commerce in the US? Obviously, things like Facebook checkout and Instagram checkout are getting traction in the West. My hypothesis is that they are going to get big in the West. And here is why. Before the pandemic, this was the biggest difference between shopping in China and shopping in the US. If you were in a tier one or tier two city in China, you almost certainly, more than 90% of shoppers had a digital wallet. That meant um, Alipay or Tencent had your credit card on file, not really your credit card, but your bank details on file. And it was one click to buy something from WeChat or to buy something from a Taobao Lao, uh, Taobao Live live stream. Say that 10 times really fast. Um, in the United States, to buy something from a, a social network, you needed three hands. You needed one to hold the phone, one to tap the screen, and one to hold your credit card because that was the only way to pay, right? And that's not a very seamless experience. So digital wallets to me are a big enabler of social commerce. And guess what happened in the pandemic? Uh, we went from 21% of all e-commerce in the US using a digital wallet to over 30% of all um, uh, e-commerce in the US using a digital wallet. So we got this rapid acceleration. Um, that to me is a one-way door. Once you create that digital wallet, uh, it's more friction-free shopping. Now you can use ShopPay to check out on Instagram Live. It's a much more seamless experience. Um, I, I think we're going to see more, more tractions on those platforms. Um, I am uh, slightly behind, so I got to uh, pick up the pace. But I just want to remind you, everyone conflates social commerce with live streaming commerce. I like to say there's, there's like uh, five flavors of social commerce. There's using these social platforms for product discovery. That's influencers and ads and things like that. There's selling stuff on the platform. That's Facebook checkout. Uh, there's selling stuff in a video on the platform. That's uh, YouTube shopping actions. There's one to many live streaming. That's a, a real, that's a Facebook stories or, or a YouTube live. And then there's one to one live streaming. That's a Neiman Marcus sales associate uh, uh, on a, uh, a, a live stream with an individual customer. So just think about all those different use cases. Social has gone so big that even I am now on YouTube. So you can check out uh, YouTube uh, forward slash retail geek and see better versions of some of my presentations uh, recorded on YouTube. Love your feedback. Um, next big question, are people going to walk back to the store? In the United States of America right now, uh, store traffic is still down 20%. Um, if we go to foreign countries in China where they're significantly ahead of us in the recovery, 
uh, retail sale, uh, foot traffic is still down 10%. Interestingly, um, what a lot of brands are seeing is that customers are going to the store less but buying more when they go to the store. That's what Coca-Cola is seeing. At Walmart in Q4, um, their total transactions were down 14%, but sales were up 27% because customers are bundling more. They're picking one retailer, fewer trips, buying more in each trip. This has a prominent impact on, on the, the lay of the land in, in retail. We talked about China already. Um, a big flavor of retail that totally lost in the pandemic is small retailers, right? Independent retailers, which are a 25% of all retail sales, um, didn't have a lot of cash on hand. If they had an, an interruption, they likely went bankrupt. There are all these doomsday forecasts, 25% of stores could close. I, uh, that is not the big chains, right? So here's what happens. If you're in grocery before the pandemic, Walmart, Kroger, and Albertsons were 40% of Procter & Gamble sales. After the pandemic, Walmart, Kroger, and Albertsons are likely 62% of Procter & Gamble sales. So the balance and power is shifting to the retailer. They're going to get better terms. They're, they're going to negotiate harder with the brands. It's a lose for the brands. Another big trend, we all had to work at home, right? Before the pandemic, we spent 5% of our work hours at home. During the pandemic, we spent 60% of our, or 40% of our, 60% uh, of our work hours at home. So is this a one-way door or a two-way door? We're for sure going to go back to office more, but probably not back to where we were before. Um, uh, Bill Gates is a pretty smart dude. He thinks a lot of this work from home is going to be permanent. Maybe you only go to the office four days a week instead of five. That has all kinds of impacts on how much gas you buy, how many Starbucks trips you make, how many convenience store trips you make, um, uh, how many times you go out to lunch. All of these things are influenced by, by changes in work from home. Um, I mentioned food. Food is a huge deal. We all got all our calories from grocery stores instead of restaurant. We went from 50-50 to 70-30 grocery stores. And oh, by the way, the, the sales that we did get to restaurants were all digital. Every uh, major chain restaurant in America is now a digital first retailer. They have more than 50% of their sales coming from websites. In most cases, they don't own those websites. So there's all kinds of economic implications there. Um, don't have time to go into it. But another interesting trend, every retailer in America is trying to become a brand. Every retailer's number one strategy to compete with Amazon is to sell their own stuff that you can't get on Amazon. Target's better than, at that than anyone. And, and how are all the brands responding? They're all trying to become retailers and sell direct. So you're seeing this in interesting collision of frenemies um, there. Last trend I'm going to talk about um, is apparel. Apparel is a huge part of retail. It's one of the, the most adopted uh, flavors of e-commerce. Amazon became the largest apparel retailer in the in the U.S. Not online apparel, apparel retailer in the U.S. Uh, last year. Um, apparel was already facing a lot of headwinds before the pandemic. In 1990, consumers spent seven percent of their budget on clothes. In 2019, they spent um, three and a half percent of their budget on clothes. So their clothes budget got cut in half. Then the pandemic hits, and can you all spot the trend in this picture? Sure, uh, none of us are going to work. We're all just wearing sweatpants. And even our icons and sort of uh, fashion advisors on the television are all working in hoodies now, right? So this is a huge trend. Is this a one-way door or a two-way door? We're all watching these talk show hosts to find that out. So far, only one of them has gone back to a suit. So it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, and then very last point, as I've kind of uh, uh, abused my time, um, what, it, what is the future going to look like? Well, uh, it was the weirdest uh, economic circumstances of all time. We had all this economic uncertainty. We had job uncertainty, um, but we had tons of economic stimulus and savings rates actually went through the roof. So, so a lot of speculation that there's going to be revenge spending, that there's a lot of pent up demand. People are going to go out and make frivolous purchases, that they're tired of living in sweatpants and they're all going to buy uh, bright, vibrant apparel, what we're called calling peacocking. Um, by the way, none of us are the same weight that we were before the pandemic. We either did well or didn't do well, and so we need new sizes. So a lot of brands that really struggled in the pandemic are forecasting that their comps are going to be astronomical because of these new trends. Um, roaring 20s is the term you're going to see most often in the um, the the uh, the annual stock reports, you know, as, as CEOs are all predicting the roaring 20s are coming. Um, side note, uh, 
the Great Depression was basically the result of the last Roaring Twenties, so I'm not sure it's a 100% good thing, um, but hopefully that uh, will be a different outcome this time. And uh, that's all the time I have, but uh, I hope some of this was thought-provoking and interesting. I'd love to talk about it more with you um, at the, the coffee later today. And uh, until then, happy commercing.